Uh, yes, uh, in the last class we were discussing about Finis. Uh, we discussed about his idea of objective goods, basic values, whichever uh, you know, terminology you like. And we discussed about his uh, idea of practical reasonableness. We discussed about uh, the methodological principles of uh, practical reasonableness and how you apply them to arrive at you know, a right moral conclusion. So that's the practical you know, reasoning. Okay? And that's how we do practical reasoning as uh, Finnis taught us. Uh, so, and then he, uh, of course, we discussed how Finnis' approach is different from consequentialism. When we use the term consequentialism, we essentially refer to uh, utilitarianism being one of those you know, uh, consequentialist approaches. And then uh, uh, we we saw how you know wh how and why Finnis disagrees with you know consequentialist and a way of thinking, and uh, we also looked at uh, for example your uh, one of the problems that we see with Finnis's approach uh, is that you know sometimes it might end up doing exactly <laughs> what it wants to avoid. Okay. So that's done and you know that's it for now. If you guys are interested, uh, read his book, as I mentioned earlier, Nature Law, Nature Rights. Now, before we con conclude, <coughs> uh, finish, uh, let's uh, discuss about uh, one last thing as we have been, you know, uh, ritualistically doing, you know, with all the nature law thinkers as to what their position is on the relation between uh, law and morality okay so what essentially we, we are saying is that to what extent do they subscribe to that you know that maxim that we've been talking about repeating uh, you know after completion of every nature law philosopher that is lex injusta non est lex to what extent does our philosophy here john finnis uh, subscribe to that idea now, um, as is the case with most philosophers, he doesn't give you a very, like, you know, direct answer that, you know, this is what, <clears throat> you know, I subscribe to, nor would it be possible for him to do it, okay, because, you know, it's not black and white, the explanation can't be this or that, okay, so we have to, as, uh, you know, just like the philosophers here, who are deep thinkers, have to appreciate why they say what they say. So what does he say about application of this principle, lex injusta non est lex? That is, an unjust law is not a law. Now, the thing is, uh, he's, uh, he, he, he identifies, essentially, if you read the reading, okay, we can look at uh, this idea of legal obligation, okay, the question of legal obligation, whether, you know, I'm uh, obliged to follow an un unjust law or not, okay. This question of obligation, okay, uh, can be looked at from you know many different perspectives. Okay, so if you have read, you'll see that our uh, this author of this book, Sri Ratna Palas, focuses on this four different aspects. Okay, that Finis deals with. Okay, so the first way we we look at our duty to obey the law. Okay, whether what duty do we have to obey the law? Okay, so this is a good transitional topic because after this we are taking up. Uh, legal positivism, so this is what we are going to discuss there as well, okay. So the, the, he is essentially discussing the question of, you know, duty of obeying the law, okay. When do I have a duty to obey the law and when do I not have a duty to obey the law, okay. So yes, uh, the question of disobedience can be looked at in these different ways, okay. So the first way that he looks at it is that so if you if you were uh, the one okay who's considering whether you know the laws you know will be able to hold you or not okay so for example you are walking you know by the road and you they say you you see this you know empty shop okay empty shop I mean uh, there's a shop but there's no owner of the shop okay it has displayed everything there you want a nice piece of cake which is displayed there okay. You know that there is no one to see you, okay, if you take that key and you are able to run away. So the law will not be able to punish you, okay? So here you might come to this conclusion that, okay, in this instant situation, in the light of this fact situation, 
law will have no grip over me, okay? And then you might want to say that, okay, therefore I have no duty to, you know, uh, the law will not be able to hold me to account for my action. So uh, will there be any consequence if I, you know, do this, okay, if I pick this cake up, okay, and then run away? If you think, if you find that law is not able to do something like that, okay, then you say that, okay, there is no obligation here. You can say it like that, okay. So this is in fact the sense, you know, in which one can understand, you know, Austinian idea of obligation, okay. Austin's idea that law uh, is essentially a command from the sovereign and if you disobey, if you do not follow, there will be certain consequences, okay. But if you're able to avoid the consequences, is there a legal obligation there then, okay? So in this first sense, in the pure factual sense of the term, okay, without looking at any other consideration, it seems that, you know, <laughs> you do not have any obligation. So yeah, that's the first part. Empirically, okay, empirical li liability to sanction in the, obedience, in the event of disobedience. So how likely is it that you are going to be able to escape the sanction uh, of the law? You find that this is very high likely and you do in fact escape. So there is no obligation to obey the law. So this is one of the ways of looking at, you know, obedience, okay, obedience to law, obligation to follow the law. So in fact, this is the Austinian sense as we will discuss, okay. So it seems that in this situation, you do not have it, okay, because law is not able to, you know, you know catch you. So there is another way, okay, of looking at it, okay, that is in the intrasystemic uh, sense, okay. Now, who looks at it, uh, you know, looks at the idea of obligation from that sense? It's essentially, you know, the lawyers, okay. Lawyers look at it, the law in that intrasystemic, you know, sense, okay. Now, what's um, intrasystemic sense? So, we can put this question in this way, okay, if you, as you, if you can see it in the reading, that is there a legal obligation in the legal sense, okay? Is there a legal obligation in the legal sense, okay? Now the question that arises is what the hell is legal sense, okay? Now when we talk about legal sense here, we are essentially talking about certain formal requirements of the law, certain formal criteria that needs to be fulfilled. So for example, whether the law has been passed you know, in the parliament, whether law has been passed following the proper procedures, okay? Whether the presidential accent have been received or not, okay? If all the, you know, requirements, formal, you know, requirements have been fulfilled, okay, then you might say that you as a law, lawyer will say that, well, there is a law, okay, and the law is applicable, okay, uh, here in this instant fact situation, okay, and then you say that, yes, there is a <coughs> legal obligation in the legal sense, okay. When I say in the legal sense, all I'm saying is that we are not considering the moral question yet, okay, so one might say that, one who is talking about, you know, uh, legal obligation in the legal sense will say that moral questions do not really matter to us, okay? Any other inquiry do not really matter to us, okay? Whether the law has been, you know, enacted following the formal requirements of enacting the law, yes, if the answer is yes, then yes, there is a, uh, the law is valid and we are obliged to follow the law, okay? Now, in this sense as well, even in intrasystemic sense, okay, our philosopher John Finney says that that's not the totality of what actually, you know, happens, okay. But even in this sense, we cannot completely separate the moral questions from the legal questions. Some sort of moral questions will still be there, okay. So when the judges decide a particular matter, okay, the judges do take into consideration certain moral considerations, okay, uh, certain moral factors in deciding a particular matter, okay. So um, we will discuss later on, okay, in interpretation of statutes, we'll see that when, while interpreting a statute, the plain or literal interpretation of the words leads to some absurd, you know, outcome, then the judges, you know, you know, give a meaning to those words, okay, which is probably not the literal meaning, or if it were, if it had two different meanings, it will give the meaning which seems to be appropriate in this case, okay. So we see that there's a rule of statutory interpretation called golden rule of interpretation, which is used by the judges. And when they use that, they deviate from the literal, you know, 
the words of the legislation, the literal meanings of the uh, legislation, so as to give it a, you know, acceptable, or reasonable, you know, meaning uh, or interpretation to the statute. So while they do so, uh, our philosopher says, which is also the case, that they have in the back in back back of their mind certain moral considerations. So even in the intra sense, you know, systemic sense, okay, it, there is still certain moral considerations, okay, certain moral factors that we cannot, we, we will have to lie to be able to say that, okay, morality does not play part, okay. And also another example given uh, given is of that of the test of reasonableness, okay. So whether your action has been reasonable or not, okay. We do not look at, for example, the test of reasonableness from what an ordinary person would consider as, you know, reasonable. Nor do we look at, you know, the test of, you know, the question of reasonableness from some, you know, expert in the subject, okay, someone who's extremely, you know, well-read and uh, has some very deep, deeper understanding of certain, you know, subjects. We do not look for experts either, but we definitely look for someone you know, who is not just, you know, an average, average person, because quite often an average person, you know, does not agree to what is reasonable, do not come at the reasonable, you know, outcome. Uh, so this idea of reasonableness then, okay, is then given meaning to by the judges, okay? And while they do so, can we say with a straight face that, you know, some understanding of justice, some understanding of morality, you know, doesn't play a part here, okay? We cannot say so. So even in the interim systemic sense, some questions of morality, uh, justice, etc., will always be there, okay? So yes, uh, that's the second sense, intrasystemic sense, but our philosopher says that even in the intrasystemic sense, the question, some questions of morality will still be there, okay? So now the second sense is the legal obligation in the legal sense, okay? The first was legal obligation in the factual sense, okay? The third one is legal obligation in the moral sense, okay? Now, here's where the problems arise, okay? Here's the question of applicability of the doctrine of lex in just and honest lex, okay? So the question is, if a law is unjust, okay? If a law is unjust, whether I have an obligation to obey the law, okay? Now, if you were to ask a positivist, legal positivist, that's exactly what we're going to study next, this particular question, uh, they will say that, well, those moral questions, okay, uh, are relevant, are very important. We do not deny their importance, but that's not the concern of a jurisprudent, okay? That's not the subject of jurisprudence, uh, what the subject of jurisprudence deals with. Maybe you can do it with you know, moral philosophy itself. But then one may ask this question that why not, why can't we study that question, okay, within the subject of jurisprudence, okay? So this is something that is very essential, okay? So if any should say that, no, we need to deal with this question, okay? Even in this sense, okay? We cannot just, you know, discount, ignore, you know, legal obligation in the more moral sense. That is still relevant. So he says, given that legal obligation presumptively entails a moral obligation and that the legal obligation is by and large, okay, legal system is by and large just, does a particular unjust law impose upon me a moral obligation to conform to it, okay? So that's something, that question that still remains relevant for us, okay? And he gives us three different, you know, reasons to say that, yes, that legal obligation in the moral sense is still relevant for us. You may still call the unjust law law in the intrasystemic sense, but in the moral sense, whether that law, okay, in the intrasystemic sense ought to be followed or not, is still part of the very same discourse, okay? So he, he gives us three different, you know, reasons in saying that ignoring this legal obligation in moral sense from jurisprudential perspective is not justified, okay? So what are those three reasons? The first reason that he gives is that he says this proposed separation of this legal thesis and moral thesis is artificial, okay? Okay, so he says that quite often it is used, okay, but no one really accepts that, okay? So he says the types of, you know, moral arguments that positivists expel from the jurisprudence are in fact used in legal practice and often find favor with the judges. So as we discussed a little while ago, that 
judges when they decide a particular matter okay they do not decide only in the intrasystemic sense they do take recourse to certain other you know what this positivist okay legal positivist calls call us you know external questions okay they do look at all those so while they decide a particular matter those ideas of justice are definitely taken into consideration by judges so why would that be not part of our discussion okay so it it uh, it's like you know uh, it's hypocritical to say that okay <laughs> it, it does not concern us okay so he says that the said proposed you know separation is not uh, real but it's artificial the second reason that he provides you know uh, for this said assertion is that he says a jurisprudence that banishes such you know question you know to other discipline will amount to no more than lexicography of a particular culture so you know to simplify what he's saying is uh, that if anyone asserts that you know those moral questions should not be part of you know a legal discourse all that you are doing is giving us example from your own legal system that you are describing so maybe in england our philosophers like you know um austin uh, fuller and no, sorry not fuller austin and hart okay maybe they you know that idea of legal system the idea of legal system, obligation that they are describing maybe it is peculiar of their own legal system maybe we can find other legal system where these moral questions are very part part and parcel of that legal obligation in the intrasystemic you know sense of the term okay so if at all you are insisting on this you are doing nothing more than giving us a description of the legal system that you are part of okay or maybe the one that you are studying okay so this is what finis had to say okay so he's saying that this is not the whole truth okay this is not the whole truth you have to look at other legal systems as well and without looking at them you cannot just make a generalized comment about it okay and the third reason that he provides is that that even those thinkers who assert the said you know separability thesis okay they also wittingly unwittingly or knowingly unknowingly they do use those moral questions okay they do use certain moral assumptions okay so he says so here our author author says that he said accuse those who propose the separate moral questions from their descriptions of law of failing consistently to observe what they propose okay so what he is being essentially saying is that sometimes they say that yes we do not you know do business with the moral questions but they in fact do so they just do not admit it okay so this is what he is saying so certain examples you know not really examples okay you can take up set of examples the things that we have already discussed so moral questions do still play a part in the legality of uh, legal validity of law okay so this is what finis's stand is on this question of you know relation between law and morality okay now here is the conclusion that he comes to about uh, uh, application of the doctrine of maxima of lex in justa non est lex he says that lex in justa non est lex in fact is applicable so an unjust law uh, is not a law but in what sense okay when he says so he's saying that in the intrasystemic sense okay so for example austin hart defines law in a certain way so in that intrasystemic sense maybe it is a law okay but then do i have an obligation to follow the law then i do not have to confine my myself only to that intrasystemic systemic description of law i also have to look at certain moral you know consideration okay so he says that this maxim is applicable okay but he, you then look at the moral questions as well which is very much part of the jurisprudential discussion okay so that's it okay uh, so he says that you know this uh, obligation okay if if a law is unjust okay an unjust in enactment may be considered as invalid although it may be obligatory in the formal legal sense so that's a very you know uh, specific position that he takes with regard to unjust law that you may still call it law but do you have a moral obligation to obey the law he says that no you may not have a moral obligation to obey the law okay so i hope this is clear so for example i started with uh, you know quoting martin luther luther, luther king on whether unjust law is not is not law he says that no unjust law is not law our, our philosopher here says and hence you do not have a, have an obligation so our philosopher here is saying that an unjust law may still be law in the formal sense of the term but you may not have obligation to 
follow the law. That probably de depends on the egregiousness of, uh, you know, of the law. Now then, one more question that he deals with that puts him, you know, in the same criteria of philosophers as, you know, Aquinas has been, is that when, sh at what point, okay, uh, will I be justified in uh, not obeying the law? Okay, so here's, and at, and at what point, even if the law is unjust, I have to still follow the law, okay? So this question for you to be able to answer, you have to look at some moral questions here, okay? What is that? So he's saying that, okay, so if, if a law is unjust, okay, if a, if a legal system is generally just, okay, and the law is enacted, which I think is unjust, do I have an obligation to not obey the law, okay? He would say that if, I, if you do not obey the law and it's going to harm the legal system, okay, in such a way that it gives rise to a moral obligation in you that a system which is generally just should be there because not obeying the law will cause greater harm, okay? So you now have an obligation to, uh, you know, follow the law even when you think that a law is unjust. But then you know there is a gradation involved even here. If the legal system is generally unjust, okay, for example, the Nazi regime, then obviously it's crystal clear to you that you have a moral obligation to not obey such law, okay? So yes, it, I think, you know, my understanding, I do not attribute it to our philosopher here, is, is this, that it depends on how egregiously, you know, distant a legal system is from certain, you know, moral parameters, okay? on which we do not have much disagreement. It's not just about, you know, we disagree disagreeing about taste of food or the color that we like. It's not just that. So if, if it is of such an egregious, you know, nature, then we do have an obligation to uh, not obey the law. But if it is just one of those, you know, laws that you think, you know, is not just according to you, but if you do not obey it, then it harms the legal system, which is generally just, okay? In that situation, you have a moral obligation to obey a law that you think is unjust, okay? So that's his position on, uh, uh, you know, this doctrine of lex injusta, non est lex. So with that, we conclude our discussion on John Finney.